Lord be with you. Welcome to Stone Church of Willow Glen. We welcome all persons into our community, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, age, physical or mental capacity, education, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, and socioeconomic or marital status. We're just had, glad to have you here, and we count it a privilege to join you wherever you may be in your own spiritual journey. Um, you may notice that Fred Harrell, who's our interim pastor, is away on vacation, but we are pleased to welcome um, a guest pastor. Let me make sure I get this right. Um, the Rev Reverend Jonathan Gundlach. Um, after brief careers in law and business, Reverend Gundlach pursued seminary and re reformed church in America ordination and served with Fred Harrell for many years as executive pastor at City Church in San Francisco. Um, and one reminder, um, we've gotten sort of lax about this. Please pass the pew pads down the, down the rows so that whether you're a member or a visitor, you can record your presence with us today. And now let us prepare ourselves to worship our good, our good and gracious God. We don't have an introit. Okay. And now the call to worship. We will praise you, O oh God, because you have delivered us. We cried to you for help, O oh God, and you restored our hell. You brought us back from the realm of the dead. You spared us from going down into the pit. Sing to God, you who love the Lord. Praise God's holy name. For God's anger is fleeting, but God's favor endures forever. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. O oh God, you have turned our despair into dancing. You have removed the shroud of death and closed us with joy. Therefore, how could we keep from singing? How can our hearts be silent? You are our God. We will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Now please stand in body or spirit for opening hymn, which is number 481 in the Pew Hymnal. <laughs>
and now the call to confession. God, you created my inmost being and stitched me together in my mother's womb. For all these mysteries, I thank you. For the wonder of myself, for the wonder of your works, my soul knows it well. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God, who made me in your image, teach me to love myself as you love me. God, who made me in your image, allow me to show that image to the world. God, who made me in your image, help me to see your image in all those I meet. God, who made me in your image, teach me to conserve and protect all your creation. God, who made me in your image, bless, protect, and keep me all for your children's sake. Now take time in the silence of this place to make this prayer your own. The one who breathed life into our lungs continues to be present with us. God, who has made us reflective of God's own image, has forgiven us all and made us new creations. Therefore, since our sins are forgiven, let us go forth with love and peace, honoring and upholding the dignity of all we meet, knowing we see reflections of God's image all around. Thanks be to God. And now let us extend the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace, everyone. Peace. 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 Peace, peace everyone. Yeah. Peace. Uh, peace to everyone. Marianne, Lawrence, uh, Charlotte. Good to see the thorns and yeah, the rages and the summers. I'm Rosalie. <laughs> Hi, yes. Morning, Marge. Mars. Good. Charlotte. Good morning, Marge. Marge. Hey, Neil. Summer Hi, speaks Charlotte. to you. Neil. Hey, Bob. Oh, Charlotte, I hear you've been ill. Yes. Peace, Marianne. Peace to you. Peace to you. Neil, peace, 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 Rosalie. Yeah. Thank you. Martha. Peace to the thorns. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And to you, Bob. Yes. Peace. To all of you. Steve yes. and Karen. Peace. Good to see your faces. Peace, Bruce and Ida. Yeah, peace, Marjorie. Good morning. Good morning. Peace, everyone. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, Alice. Nice to see you. Hi, Rod. Hi. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Everybody. Good morning. They are so ready for summer to start. What's your favorite thing to do during the summer? I don't know. We make a bucket list, and we add things like miniature golf, Great America, the beach, the pool, cousin time, sleepovers, late nights, music nights. We have all these things on our summer bucket list that we cross off as we go along. Summer is such a special time, especially when you're a kid. I've noticed now that an adult, summer is not so much fun, and it's almost a little bit worse, I feel, because I don't get to go off and have those times. I have to go and work, and that's not so much fun, but I do get to enjoy those wonderful days with my kids. It's time for adventures and fun and making lots and lots of memories. But even though during the summer we don't have Sunday school, today is actually our last day of Sunday school until the fall, um, we can still grow our relationship with Jesus, even if we're not here for a Sunday school. I'm going to think about a story in the Bible, and this one is very specific. It's about a time when Jesus goes on an adventure with all his buddies, 
And Jesus wanted to go on a fishing trip. So he called up all his buddies, like, hey, guys, you want to go on a fishing trip? I got this boat. And they're like, yeah, sure. So they all went to the lake, and they hung out on the boat all day long. And it was a beautiful day, and the sun was shining. They probably got a suntan, maybe a burn as well. But you know what? They didn't catch a single fish. All day long, they caught zero fish. And Jesus said, you know, why don't we cast our nets over on the other side? And they're like, oh, all right. I don't know if that's going to make much of a difference. But they did anyway, and they cast their nets over onto the other side. And guess what? They caught so many fish that the nets actually began to break. Now, this th story tells us two important things. The first is that we should always bring Jesus along to our adventures because he kind of sounds like a fun person to have around, and he's really useful. And the second thing is that we should always listen to him because he has some really good things to learn, or we have a lot of really good things to learn from him. So as we start our summer, let's think about how we can invite Jesus to come along with us on all of our adventures. We can every day be thankful. We can be thankful for spending the time with our family, our friends, being able to sleep in, getting a little bit extra screen time in. And when we're thankful, remember that every good thing comes from God. We can also every day be kind. Maybe it's letting someone at the pool use our floaty. Maybe it's opening the door for somebody on our way out or telling someone how much they mean to us. No matter what it is, you can show God's love through those actions. And lastly, we can pray. We can thank God every day for all those wonderful things he's provided us and that we're healthy, we're safe, and we're loved. This summer, let's remember that Jesus is, and let's remember Jesus and bring him along on all those adventures. Just like he was with his disciples on that boat, he is with us when we play, explore, and rest. Let's be thankful, show kindness, and spend time with him. If we do, I have a feeling that this summer will be the best adventure ever because we'll be sharing it with Jesus. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the gifts of summer. Help us to remember that your son is always with us. Teach us to be thankful, kind, and spend time with you. Bless our adventures and help us grow closer to you. Amen. The first lesson of scripture this morning comes from Psalm 98, verses 1 through 4. And you can read along in the Pew Bible, the Old Testament, page 551. Hello. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. The word of the Lord.
Well, good morning, and that was absolutely lovely, and it's so good to be with you this morning, uh, and I mean that. It was lovely driving up, easy drive from San Francisco, and then uh, the neighborhood is so beautiful, and when you see the church on a beautiful day like this, it really shines out. Um, I'm Jonathan Gunlock. I know we haven't met before, but I've worked with Fred Harrell for many years. We're good friends. Uh, we worked together at City Church San Francisco for a long time, and I can tell when I talk to him about his work with you all, that he's really enjoying his time with you. Um, and so it's nice for me to get a little taste of this community as well. But I'm also um, really looking forward to talking a bit about this passage from Acts chapter 10. It's a really long passage, like 36 verses. It's what it takes to tell the story. But because it's so long, I'm not going to do the whole reading right here. We're going to jump into the story. It might be familiar to many of you, it might be new, but we'll talk through the story of what's going on here with the story of Peter, the apostle, and Cornelius, the centurion. And then I will kind of zero in on particular verses as we go along. We can read those together. But this is one of my favorite passages, particularly during this season, these few weeks after Pentecost, where you see the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts moving out and kind of breaking down all kinds of barriers and exclusions and welcoming all kinds of people in that were never part of the faith community in the past. But it's also a time where, and, th and this is lately what I'm really interested in, God is doing, and the Holy Spirit is also doing a work in and among the apostles, the leaders of this early Jesus community themselves, opening their imaginations of what's possible leading them step by step through some radical transformations in their faith. And when we read these stories, we kind of can see the ending. We kind of know how it works out if you just keep reading. They had to live this out just like we do in real life, day by day, trying to discern what the Spirit was doing. And so I want us to keep that in mind, kind of that lens in mind, particularly as we look at Peter in this story. But in Acts 10, the very beginning, it introduces us to this man named Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, which was a big deal. Centurions had a lot of power. Uh, centurions oversaw at least 100 soldiers. They were respected slash feared. Um, they were well paid. They were high, you know, kind of held a high stature in the community. But Cornelius here is a Roman centurion, meaning he's part of the occupying military power of Judea. So he's got all that going on, but the interesting thing about him is he's a God-fearer. And that's kind of a term of art used in the day of people who were not part of the Jewish community that worshipped the Jewish God. Cornelius is, is a God-fearer. He says he prayed constantly. He says that he would give large amounts of his wealth to the poor. And so all the people respected him. But the thing is, he worships the Hebrew God, but he has to do it from a distance. He's doing it from the outside, kind of looking in. He has to worship in secret. He can't go to the temple and offer prayers because that would be political and you know, uh, vocational suicide. 
He's a Roman centurion. He's not even allowed to really associate with Jewish people at all in the day. At least the Jewish people, a faithful Jew, is not allowed to associate with a Gentile. Can't go into their house. Can't share, share a meal, meal together. Can't have a conversation about your mutual faith in this God. So Cornelius, Cornelius is a God-fearer. He is following the same God as the Hebrews, but he has to do it in secret and from a distance. He is ceremonially unclean. He can't, he's unfit for true worship. He's unfit for even true friendship in the faith community. So I'm sure it was much to his surprise, this Cornelius, that one day, and this comes to us in verse 4 and 5, kind of out of nowhere, while he's in prayer, an angel appears to him and says to him, Cornelius, look, your prayers and your alms, your good works, your, your giving to the poor, these things have ascended as a memorial before God. They've ascended as a memorial before God. Now send to Joppa, is a little town up the road or up the coast, for a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. He's staying at the house of a tanner, who's also named Simon. And this house is by the seaside. Send for him, and he will show you more of what you need to know about how to enter into a deeper relationship with me. This angel uses these words. They're very intentional words. Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. The writer here wants us to see a direct connection to the old Levitical laws because that language is taken straight out of the book of Leviticus, talking about the offerings and the prayers of the Jewish priests, the Hebrew priests, rising before God as a memorial. And so in a sense, what the angel is saying here is, look, Cornelius, I know you've been worshiping from a distance, but the God of the Hebrews, the God you are worshiping has seen you, has received your prayers, has received your good works, just like the offerings of the Hebrew Jewish priests. So send for this Peter who can help you, who can tell you more. So Cornelius immediately does that. He sends three of, his, three of the men under his command. Two are our servants, and one is a soldier who's also a believer and worshiper of God. Sends them on a two-day journey. It's about 40 miles to go up the coast to go find this Peter at the Tanner's house. And I love these little clues that are sort of dropped into a lot of these narratives, especially this part of Book of Acts, because the fact that we're being told Peter is staying at a tanner's house is actually a clue right at the very beginning. Because to be a tanner, to have a tanner's house, you'd have a tannery, a shop, kind of down in the first floor of your house. These are the preparers of animal skins and of leather. It's, uh, it's messy business, especially the way it was practiced back in the day. It's messy, it's smelly, there's animal skins and sometimes carcasses and hides and bloody. And it was not unclean, according to the purity codes at the time, but it was definitely uncouth. Like, if you're a well-respected, law-abiding Jew at the time, you are going to stay as far away from the house of a tanner as you can. It's, um, it's just the kind of thing you don't want to be associated with. It's sort of like the tax collectors back in the day. It was that kind of a vocation. So it's really interesting that this is exactly where we find Peter. Peter has been ministering. We haven't heard a lot about him for the last several chapters of the book of Acts, but when he reappears, he's staying at this place that a good Jew wouldn't go to, wouldn't hang out at, at least for very long. That's right where he is, though, and he's, it's showing like he's already shifting. There's something changing in him where Peter's not concerned, as concerned as maybe he would have been at one time, of hanging around with the right kinds of people. He's just not concerned about that. But it takes Cornelius' men two days to get there, and now it's the second day, and they're getting close. They're like within a couple miles of Peter's house. And this is where the text really takes off. The story really takes off. Because Peter, it says he was in prayer, and he wanted to go up to the roof to pray at this tanner's house, but he was also hungry. So he sends for some food. He's waiting for the food to arrive. He's hungry. He's in prayer. He's staying in this house. It has all this you know, animal stuff going on. And while he's in prayer, something that rocked his world forever happens. There's a vision. He falls into a trance, and then there's a vision, and the verse picks up at uh, verse 11 through 16. It says, Peter saw the heaven opened, and something like a large sheet came coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. And in this sheet, there were all kinds of 
four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then Peter heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. But the voice said back to him a second time, Peter, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. And this happens three times, and then all of a sudden the sheet is, with all the animals is pulled right back up into heaven. It's over, just as quick as it started. It's over. And it's truly a wild vision. Like, I remember as a kid with having one of those storybook Bibles with lots of artwork and seeing a painting, a picture of this scene and just, like, not being able to get my mind around it. It was so weird. Like, this sheet with all these animals spilling out. This particular Bible actually had a kangaroo in the sheet. And even as a kid, I'm like, Australia is a really long way <laughs> from the Middle East. So I wasn't sure what to make about that. So it's just a bizarre vision to begin with on all sorts of levels. But what we really need to see is the absolute cognitive crisis this vision would have initially presented Peter with. Because in it, you've got all the wrong kind of an animals. All the animals that his scriptures, that his purity codes, clearly said were unclean. You cannot eat them. You can't even touch them. You're not supposed to. And then the voice of God saying, no, kill and eat. Break these very laws that have held your people together as a community for hundreds of years. And Peter, of course, initially protests. I think any of us would be in that situation. I can't do that. I've never done it, and I never will. And then the voice of God making it even more kind of concerning, saying, look, what God has made clean, you should not call profane. But the thing is, Peter isn't calling the food profane on his own authority. He's trying to follow his scriptures. So can you imagine how perplexing that moment must have been for him? Trying to make sense of what this thing is, and then it just disappears. The vision ends. And he is initially, he's just confused. He doesn't know what it means. And I love that the scripture actually lets us into his mind a little bit, showing us how perplexing this is. In verse 17, it says, right after this happens, Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled, greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. So it's right at that moment. I mean, the timing is incredible. Peter wakes up. His head is still spinning. What does this whole thing mean? And right then, Cornelius' men show up. They're standing out by the gate to this house. They're actually calling out, for is this the house of Peter? We're looking for this Peter. And then again, two verses later, in verse 19, it gives us another peek into Peter's mental state. It says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, he's still struggling with it. Like, what am I supposed to do with that vision? He senses the Spirit say to him, look, these three men that are out there searching for you, go with them. Don't be afraid. Go without hesitation, for I've sent them. So I love that the scriptures give us this much insight into what Peter's actually experiencing, trying to discern what is happening in this moment. He's wrestling with the vision. He doesn't know what to make of it. He's surprised by these men that show up kind of out of nowhere. And in that confusion, though, he's sort of putting it together, and he feels somewhere in his heart the spirits say, something new is going on here. I need to go listen to those men. So he takes the next step. He doesn't know yet. He won't know for a while how this whole story is going to turn out. But he takes the next step. He goes and talks to them. They say, this centurion is sent for you. He wants to meet with you. He says, yes. Peter says, yes, which is something I'm sure he never imagined happening, even that morning when he woke up. But then he goes one step further. It's a two-day journey to get down to Caesarea where Cornelius is. So Peter invites these three men, a Roman soldier and two Gentile servants, into his house to stay the night which on its own was also a violation of the purity codes because, again, the Jews could not associate in that way with Gentiles. So I try to think about what it was like for Peter that night, preparing for this two-day journey to go see a centurion with a soldier in his house and two other Gentiles, 
replaying what's happened, trying to process what this whole thing is about, and knowing, having no idea how it's going to turn out, and just knowing he's supposed to take it one step at a time, and he's supposed to take the next step. This is a picture, I think, of what faith feels like, stepping out in faith, stepping out into the unknown, getting to that point where you know that it's time to move beyond the things, sometimes very good things, that have held you up until now, and having some sense that God is calling you out forward into something new and bigger, but only knowing enough to take one step at a time. One of the joys over the last few years of my life is I've, I've gotten to do, I get to do occasionally, a little bit of work with this poet named David White. He's a uh, modern contemporary poet, English-Irish, but he lives in, out here or in the U.S., in the Pacific Northwest. He has an organization that does these leadership, leadership retreats, and I get to help facilitate those sometimes. Um, he has poems that are like really deep and epic and larger than life, and then he has some poems that are really simple and sweet and nice, and this is one of those. This is called Just Beyond Yourself. I love this short poem as just a snapshot of what Peter's wrestling with in the moment. Is it time to move forward? What we wrestle with in the same moments in life. This is just beyond yourself. Just beyond yourself. It's where you need to be. Just beyond yourself. It's where you need to be. Half a step into self-forgetting and the rest restored by what you'll meet. There's a road There's a road always beckoning. And when you see the two sides of it closing together on that far horizon and deep in the foundations of your own heart at exactly the same time, that's how you know it's the road you have to follow. That's how you know it's where you have to go. That's how you know you have to go. That's how you know. It's just beyond yourself. It's where you need to be. Peter did not expect to be on this journey. He definitely didn't have any certainty as to where it was all headed, but I think he sensed this resonance between this thing God was doing in his heart and this invitation to go on that road to go see Cornelius. He hadn't pieced it all together, but he knew that vision had stirred up something new in his imagination. Couldn't make sense of it. It stirred up something new, and it seemed to resonate with this invitation to go see Cornelius. So he has just enough to take just that half step on the journey to go see what's going to happen. There's a road always beckoning when you see the two sides of it closing together at that far horizon and deep in the foundations of your own heart at exactly the same time. That's how you know. It's the road you have to follow. Now, I'm not sure a younger version of Peter could have done this. Sort of the brash, confident, overzealous version of Peter. But this is a older, weathered, and softened Peter. This is a Peter who had already failed in trying to do all the right things, had been restored by Jesus. This is a Peter who had spent so much time with Jesus, watching how Jesus would always hang around with the wrong people. How Jesus would say things that seemed to brush up against the purity codes, like, look, it doesn't matter what a person eats or takes into their body. What matters is what comes out of their heart. He spent so much time with that Jesus, so I'm sure he's replaying those memories, preparing for this journey. I'm sure he probably thought back to some of the Hebrew prophets who would occasionally drop hints, just little glimpses, that a day was coming when this distinction between Jew and Gentile would be softened or done away with kind of entirely, and when something that would have been unimaginable hundreds of years earlier, or even where Peter is at that point, a day was coming when Jews and Gentiles and all the people of the nations of all the earth would worship together as one. They were just hints in the Old Testament. But I'm sure he's playing through all that, asking questions like, is that what is beginning to play out? It's just enough to get him to go on his way. He makes that two-day journey. And it's really interesting because even after two days, when he gets to Cornelius' house, and there's, a, there's like a house full of people waiting for Peter, one of the very first things Peter says to the entire house is, look, 
we all know I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not allowed to be in this house according to my purity codes. But God seems to be showing me. This is in verse 34, 35. Or actually, sorry, it's uh, 28. God seems to be showing me that I shouldn't call anyone profane. Something profound seems to be happening here in my spiritual outlook and my spiritual imagination. But I need to hear from you, Cornelius. He wants to hear Cornelius' own story first. So even when he arrives at Cornelius' house, he's still not entirely sure how this whole thing is going to play out. Wants to hear from Cornelius. Cornelius tells the story of God's visit through the angel. As Cornelius is telling that story in verse 34, Peter, all of a sudden, it becomes so clear to him that this is truly something new. And he says, now I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears or who reveres God and does what is right is acceptable to God. And you have heard, you know the message that God has sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And then Peter goes on to describe the totality of Jesus' ministry and death and resurrection. He's telling that whole story. And as that happens, surprisingly to everyone, the Holy Spirit moves among Cornelius' house. Everyone starts worshiping God. There's all kinds of miraculous acts and worship. And then everyone is baptized. It's something Peter would never have imagined occurring, even a couple days earlier. It was so amazing that when the apostles back in Jerusalem heard about it, it was so mind-blowing to them even that initially they're concerned. They actually summoned Peter back for a little hearing in Jerusalem. Peter, what's going on? You need to explain yourself. Once Peter tells them the whole story, the apostles start rejoicing as well. Look, this amazing thing. God is now moving among all people in a new way. And we're all being called in together into the family of God. But for us, I think, when we really think about our lives, what I'm hoping we can begin to get out of a story like this is that Peter's journey of faith, this expansion that's happening, it took something. It took a spark. It took an expansion of his imagination initially to get that process going. It started with this vision that didn't even make any sense. But as Peter followed the thread and kept taking the next step and kept talking to people and really listening to people's stories, it gradually became clear. And that's really what I want us all to be able to take into the week ahead and into our lives generally. So it might be worth asking all of us asking deep in our hearts, where might God be wanting to expand our spiritual imagination? In the circumstances of our life. Where might God be calling us to let go or to kind of loosen our grip on old ways, old patterns, old rules that maybe maybe served us for a while? They were needed and they're good but now it's time to move into something new and more expansive. And this can apply to like major life decisions, like the few times in life that we approach the huge decisions around career and relationships and marriage and children and moving and all the health issues, like all those giant type questions. But I really think the call is also just as importantly, maybe even more, to the things that are close to the ground to the moment-by-moment decisions, to sometimes even what feels like the mundane circumstances of our life. There's a quote by Paula Darcy. She says, God often appears to us disguised as our life. God appears to us disguised as the circumstances of our life. And one way God's appearing as the circumstances, even of my life, kind of in the more day-to-day level, the the on-the-ground level, just the last few months, is my wife took a um, a great job, but it's it's early, and it's um, an intense job with the city of San Francisco, and which means that all of the needs of our three children and our puppy, who happens to be a border collie, who we got before any of this came on the scene, has suddenly shifted much more into my 
domain. Um, and it would be so easy amidst all the driving and the school issues and the vet appointments and the doctor's appointments and the meals and all these things. It'd be so easy to be frustrated to see them as interruptions, as limitations on me doing kind of the more important work of ministry. And I think a younger version of myself would be very tempted to go there. But graciously, somehow, in all the chaos of this current moment, it's a beautiful kind of chaos, but it's definitely chaos. In that, there's been this quiet voice in a way I've never quite experienced it before of God, the Spirit, saying, broaden your imagination about what's happening here. There are so many ways to see these circumstances. This time is short. You can view it as an interruption or you can view it as kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really get into the details of your kids' lives and even the puppies' lives the details of the day-to-day in a way you wouldn't probably choose on your own. You'd miss it. You would just miss it. So don't miss this blessing. Don't miss this blessing. It's an opening of imagination, just even for the current moment. The small things, but the small things that really matter. So whether it's kind of the big decisions of life or the smaller, close-to-the-ground, moment-by-moment, circumstances that we face, the circumstances where God is showing up as disguised as our life. My prayer for us is that we can have imaginations, spiritual imaginations that are growing in all of it. And to know that beneath all of that, the really core thing, whether it's a grand adventure that we're being called out into, whether it's just faithful living in the day to day, is what God is really wanting to do is open our imaginations to see God's desire to be close to us. God's longing for us. God's pursuit of us. Just like God was signaling to Cornelius. That even when we don't know what to do, even if we feel like we're sometimes worshiping from the outside, or things have gone cold and kind of stale, God is seeking us. And is always showing up through the Spirit as we can quiet our hearts and quiet our strategic minds. So may the Spirit of God open the eyes of our heart to experience and know the mercy and love of God that's always moving towards us this week. That's my prayer for us. Amen. over here. Friends, God has been generous with us, so let us now return to God a portion of what has been given to our care. May the ushers come forward.
Loving God, you call us to share what we have, our heart, our time, our money, our attention, our love, our joy, our passion, our companionship. May you inspire our imaginations in building this shared humanity where no one goes without, everyone is welcome, and the abundance of Christ's love is fully known and experienced by all. Amen. Let's bring our prayers and petitions to the Lord. We praise and thank you, O Lord, source of all, giver of every good gift, that you've been with us here, even this morning as we've gathered here today. And we pray that you would continue to fill us, to fill us with your spirit as we leave this place of worship and enter into a new week of work and relationships and challenges and opportunities that we would actively sense you upholding us and nourishing us daily, giving us a constant awareness that you have not left us alone in this world, that you're with us, that you're working for us, all around us, all the time. We pray for the imagination, for the spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear just where your spirit is moving around us, to see possibilities for healing, for renewal in every situation. And we pray for creativity and passion to join our daily work to yours. I pray for this community, the Stone Church of Willow Glen, that you would continue to shape and direct their future to be a source of growth and healing in this neighborhood, in this place, in this city, in this very property. I pray for every member and every attendee that they would grow more and more into the image of your son, Jesus and be renewed and strengthened daily in your love. We express our dependence on you alone, on you and your promises to heal everything that's broken in the world, in our lives, in our neighborhoods, everything. We look eagerly for the day when all will be set right and the pains of life and death and the wounds of all the nations of the earth will be healed. We pray for comfort for those who are sick and suffering, for those who lack food or shelter, and we pray for an end to all wars and all retributive cycles of violence. Loving God, we offer these prayers to you this morning, joining our voices to the great chorus of those saints around the world, even this morning, who are singing your praise and who depend on you alone. We long for that day when all your children will live in peace together. Until that day, give us patience and enduring hope rooted in Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 391. If you're able, you may stand.
Jesus. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Friends, uh, my prayer for us this week is that we might live just beyond ourselves, Just a half step into trusting that God may always be doing something new in our lives. Even in the small situations, the small circumstances, God wanting to always expand our expectations of what's possible. That we might see the Spirit of God open our imaginations to see where God is leading us in every moment. Trusting that everything we need will meet us on the journey of faith, even this week ahead. So now receive the benediction at the end if we could just respond with a hearty amen. May the mystery of the Holy Spirit dwell in you, that you may hear the voice of grace even in unknown places. May the wind of the Holy Spirit move you to cross boundaries and defy divisions to love those who are different from you. May the breath of the Holy Spirit breathe in you to forgo comfort and familiarity when necessary to meet others where they are. May the fountain of the Holy Spirit flow in you with courage and humility to learn anew, to even be awkward and foolish for the sake of love. May the fire of the Holy Spirit burn brightly in you, that in all you do, others may see in you the warm light, the warm light and the steady love of God. And may the blessing of God, the source of all, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be among you and remain with you this week and always. And together we say, Amen.